Dr. Craig, in many ways, the book On Guard is the culmination of something we've been seeing for quite some time for the lay people to have access to your material and your teaching, which was, for the most part, reserved for academia. And so the book On Guard has gotten a good reception due to that very thing. Yes, that's exactly right, Kevin. For a long time, My wife, Jan, has been urging me to write something on a more popular level that would be more accessible to people who haven't studied philosophy or theology. And On Guard is the fruit of that labor. Many people have commented to me over the years that trying to read Reasonable Faith, they had to have a dictionary (laughs) on one knee and the book on the other, and they would read them at the same time. And so it was really needful, I think, to have a book that would incorporate many of the positive arguments from reasonable faith on a simple level, but then it's more than just a a simplification of reasonable faith, because in addition to those positive arguments, there's a good deal of what I call defensive apologetics as well, that is to say responding to objections that aren't in reasonable faith. So it really is an original piece of work, but it is on a level that the average person can grasp. What I have found personally, Bill, is that when I began, I read some more simple uh, theology, philosophy, and apologetics books, and that allowed me to advance into more mid and advanced uh, material. So I think On Guard will launch that kind of thing. Yes, exactly. I, I really hope that as a result of reading On Guard as a beginning book, people's interest in the defense of the faith and uh, articulating a Christian worldview will be uh, awakened, and they'll go on then to more advanced material like reasonable faith and other sorts of works. We get letters like that all the time, that people say, this has launched me into deeper things of my faith that I, I feel I've been neglecting. So, The question would be then, Bill, how you would start the book off, what you'd want to establish first as we begin. Well, in the opening chapter of the book, I explain what apologetics is, namely the attempt to give a rational justification for the Christian worldview, and then why it's important for a Christian to be trained in this area, why he needs to invest some time and effort in being able to defend his faith. And so that opening chapter is an attempt to show people that this is not something that's just optional for a mature Christian. This is something that's really essential. 1 Peter 3.15 alone is enough to show that this really isn't an option. Right, that's a command of Scripture. To always uh, be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and reverence. We were talking off mic that um, a lot of people, a lot of Christians people of faith have gone into apologetics as kind of a hobby, but you soon realize, wait a minute, this is not a hobby. There's a lot more to this. It's uh, engaging the mind that God gave you. It really is. I think it's part of Christian discipleship, to love the Lord with all your mind. And once people capture this vision of being a true disciple of Christ in this area, of, of really intellectually engaging with your faith, then as you say, this is no mere hobby. This is really part of a person's spiritual formation as a Christian. It's part of Christian maturity. And so being able to give good reasons for faith and to answer objections to faith, I think are a part of Christian maturity for anyone who is a, a normal adult Christian, I mean with a normal mental capacity, and who's not under duress, who has the, the time and opportunity to, to study, this is, this is really part of the normal Christian life. So you establish that in the first part of the book, of the first chapters. What do we deal with from there on out in the book? Well, what I then talk about is the absurdity of life without God. This is an attempt to awaken the interest of the unbeliever in the question of God's existence. So many people think that it doesn't make any difference if God exists, that this is really irrelevant, and therefore their attitude toward God is sort of whatever. If you want to believe in him, fine. If not, it doesn't make any difference. And so in this chapter, I try to provide arguments 
that the believer can use in talking to his non-Christian friends as to why this question of God's existence is absolutely central to human existence. Because in the absence of God, that is to say, if there is no God, I think that life is absurd, that ultimately life has no meaning, value, or purpose, and that therefore this is a question that we cannot afford to be indifferent toward. We must engage with this question. Because even if life were absurd, we need to think about it. We I mean, need to realize we that. Need to realize, we need to realize it. So this isn't wishful thinking. It's not saying we can't allow life to be just absurd, just nothing, so we have to concoct something. Oh, no, here. no, no, not at all. But this is simply a, an introductory chapter to awaken people's interest in the importance of the question is all. It's not an argument that God exists and by no means, but rather it's simply an argument to say this question is central to the human predicament and therefore we need to seriously engage this question and think about it. It's very important to understand the proper place of this question in the apologetic enterprise. It's not part of the arguments for the truth of the Christian worldview. It's an attempt to awaken the apathetic, indifferent unbeliever to the importance of the question. Get you thinking about it. Exactly. I find that people can just distract themselves to oblivion today. You can play video games to your death <laughs> and keep yourself thoroughly entertained and not have to think about it. You know, so that's nothing new. That's exactly what Pascal found in the 17th century, that the French libertines of his day could engage themselves with gambling and uh, pleasures of this life and never really think about these deep human questions. And that was why Pascal began to write the, the book now called The Pensée, or the, the Thoughts or Reflections, in which he so emphasized the centrality of this question of the existence of God to the meaning of of human life. And so this opening chapter in the book is a Pascalian sort of chapter to say this is a vital question to it think about. It jolts you. Yes, it that's jolts you out of your slumbers, mm. in, in a sense. A 17-year-old writes, Dear Dr. Craig, I just wanted to start my question off by first thanking you for all the great work you put out through your books. I'm 17, and I myself am seeking God. And through watching some of your debates and understanding your arguments has given me great confidence in the Christian faith. And it has also helped me in my relationship with God. And for that, I want to thank you. And he says, my question basically is in regard to the question and purpose of life. Why did God create us? Why am I here? What does God want me to do with my life? Why did God create me? And does this entail the meaning of life? So here's someone who's asking these questions. Exactly. And that's where we want people to be so that then we can talk about whether or not there really is a God who loves you and created you to know him. On the Christian view, the purpose of human life is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's what we were made for. And so apart from him, we cannot truly find human fulfillment in, in the fullest sense of the word. We're talking about your book, On Guard, Dr. Craig. As we get further into the book, where do you encourage the layman to put his energies and what kind of arguments to defend. What follows this chapter on the absurdity of life is four chapters dealing with uh, four different arguments for God's existence that I find persuasive. And these are the contingency argument that God is the best explanation for why anything at all exists rather than nothing. Secondly, the cosmological argument that God is the best explanation for the origin of the universe at a point in the finite past. Thirdly, the design argument from the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. And then fourthly, the moral argument for God as a ground of objective moral values and duties. So these four arguments present a kind of cumulative case for a metaphysically necessary personal creator and designer of the universe who is the locus and source of absolute goodness and, and value. So that gives you a very powerful case, I think, for why we ought to believe God exists. And I try to present this in a very simple, easily memorizable form, along with answers to the most important objections that one is apt to hear from the atheist or agnostic side. 
This is a question that came to reasonablefaith.org. And he says, Dear Dr. Craig, might it not be beneficial for non-Christians to hear a personal experience? Do you ever share how you became a Christian? Now, there's something about this question, Dr. Craig, that I want to unpack first. And that is, he's saying, okay, I've been reading all your arguments and evidence, but uh, what about your personal experience? Is there a mistaken notion to think that personal experience is all that's required? Uh, I mean, we're taught that in evangelism classes Mm -hmm. as followers of Christ. Give your personal testimony. Give your personal testimony, so on and so on and so on. But that's problematic in that someone of another faith or experience can give theirs as well. But do you see kind of where he's going here? Yeah, I do. And I think that the motivation probably behind that question, Kevin, is that folks just don't connect on a deep level with abstract arguments. They want to relate to something on a personal level. And so it means more to folks to hear your personal experience. And I would think of relating your personal experience as a useful evangelistic tool, Mm -hmm. but not as properly part of the apologetic case. So I will typically share... Uh, apologetic arguments for the truth of Christianity, but then I'll end when I speak publicly on some note of personal experience to try to connect with the audience on a more emotional level, because we're not just robots, we're not just machines, and it will often mean a lot more to people to hear that personal touch. But it's not something that substitutes for argument, I think, and it's not properly part of the case for the Christian faith to relate your religious experience. I have to point out that you do give your testimony quite often. You talk about it, and if you listen to the Defenders podcast, you encourage people to have their testimony, and you have yours down. One, two, three, four, here's what happened. But I see that if you did that first, especially in in a college campus setting, and stopped at that point, well, there'd be a million questions Yeah, at that point. So you kind of answer those basic questions first and set the foundation. Then you relate your personal experience. That's it's kind of reversed these days. Mm. um, It seems to me now give your personal testimony, but then some questions may come. They may have some questions about it. Yeah, I think that's right. I I like to to close with the personal testimony, at least in a public speaking setting. I think the problem for so many Christians today, Kevin is that all they have is the personal testimony. And frankly, there's just nothing there by way of a rational defense. They're, they're without any weapons. They're, they have no ammunition. And so that just becomes then, as you say, very relativistic because anyone can share his personal experience. When you look at the title On Guard and you see the fencing symbol... Uh, with the with the sword, the right. the rapier, the the sword of the spirit, and so on, there is a defensive posture and an offensive posture. That's what apologetics would entail. Does it right? And that's it? what the book incorporates. When a a fencer is in a match, he will both know how to parry the thrusts of his opponent, but then also to make the attack of his own uh, to to go on the offense. And so in on guard. It offers both a positive case for Christianity, but then also it tries to parry the most important attacks upon the Christian faith that are out there today. What's significant about this, you're attacking arguments. Right, not, not, not people. people. <laughs> right, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I like to envision that. Uh, Paul said to do that. We tear down these things that present themselves against God. We tear down arguments. And we, we go after these things, and I... I I like to picture myself going after that in the protection and love of people who are embracing the arguments. So we go after arguments and not people. You know, and that's such a wonderful distinction when you think about it, because if you're attacking an argument, you can go after that thing hammer and tongs without ever getting into any kind of ad hominem or personal attack, Mm. because really the argument need not be offered by anyone. It could be an argument that you just thought up, and now you're examining it critically. It, does, it can be utterly disconnected from any person. And in that way, 
you, you attack the argument, but you're not attacking its proponent or its person. And so people will often say to me, for example, well, you, do you think atheists are irrational? Or do you think it's irrational to be an atheist? Do you think these atheists really believe these things, or are they just posturing? And I typically respond, as a philosopher, I'm just not interested in those questions. I, I'm not in a position to judge. I'm not making any judgment about people's personal motives or their rationality. All I'm saying is that here are some sound arguments for God's existence and that these other arguments against God's existence appear to me not to be sound. And that's the only judgment that I'm making. It's about the arguments, not about their proponents. Paul said we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. Mm. I mean, in Ephesians, the use of this book, uh, small groups, study guide, Yes, exactly. There is a study guide now that has just come out that I developed with Dennis Fuller and will take people through the book in a progressive way, chapter by chapter. And our hope is that this would be used in small groups, especially, I hope, Kevin, it will be adopted by men's groups. I think there's a real dearth of good material out there for men. And this kind of book, I think, will really appeal to men because of its rational hard-headed approach. It's not sentimental or fluffy. It's, it's very rationally oriented. And I think that men would really enjoy working through On Guard in a group where they could talk through the issues together. Get information on that on the study guide, the book itself at reasonablefaith.org. In conclusion, Bill, how has this been received? How has the book been we received? We have been overwhelmed by the response so far that we've been getting to the book through emails and personal contacts. And I'm delighted to say that there are churches that are adopting the book for use in their small groups in churches. And so we've had some orders placed at the web store for large quantities of the book that will then be distributed throughout small groups and and discussed uh, as a regular part of a church program. So that has been tremendously gratifying. And so many people saying, Here's something that's really accessible, that's really easy to understand, and how appreciative they are of all of the different features in it, the the graphics, the argument maps, the cartoons, uh, just how accessible the book is. So we are very, very grateful for the reception that the book has received so far. Oh, a quick mention. God is great. God is good. Some significant things on that as well. Right. That book received the Book of the Year Award in the category of apologetics from Christianity Today. And that just came out of left field at us. We never expected that this book would receive this kind of accolade, and and yet it was named the Book of the Year. So that is really wonderful, uh, and we hope that that will cause the book to be more widely used and read. 